At a time of deep division in today's society, we must come together for humanity's sake. On Can We Talk 360, we strive to stimulate an authentic conversation on issues that affect all of us in an environment of tolerance. I am Eugene Pettis, attorney and community servant. Tune into our discussion to foster a greater awareness of yourself and others. Let's discover how there is strength in our differences and an abundance of possibilities when we stand together as one humanity. Welcome to Can We Talk 360. I am so excited uh, to start the new year off with a man who I've admired uh, for many years, who I think has an incredible story uh, to share with us, and Mr. Desmond Mead. Welcome, Desmond. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's definitely an honor uh, to have a conversation with you today. The, um, you know, I've, I've done a number of interviews and, and so often our lives are more um, uh, single topic if there's such a thing. There's so many things wrapped up into your life that I think are rich uh, for discussion. Uh, so share with the audience, tell me um, about your early years. Where did you grow up? Was it in Florida? Introduce yourself to us. Well, surely, you know, my name is Desmond Mead. Uh, I, you know, I, I like to tell folks I'm a Florida guy, you know, uh, but I was actually born in the U.S. Virgin Islands on the island of uh, St. Croix um, in a, a town called Christianstead. Uh, but I moved uh, to South Florida at a very early age, and that's where I spent most of, of my years, you know, through elementary um high school and of course middle school but i did spend some time in the midwest in a suburb of chicago in the town called aurora illinois but when it comes down to it i am a florida boy all the way tried and true a big fan of all the uh, universities here definitely a huge fan of fiu um college of law the um you i you you spent your time and you continue to spend your time uh as a voting rights activist uh you're the executive director of florida rights restoration uh coalition uh frrc uh and you've had some significant moments in in in, in fighting for voter, voting rights which is a, obviously a current topic we continue in this country to struggle with uh, and and you were the chairman of Floridians for uh, Fair Democracy. Uh, tell me about that particular endeavor, uh, uh, Florida's uh, Floridians for a Fair Democracy. Uh, certainly, you know, and I like to tell folks that you know a lot of times when we talk about even uh, voting rights or the fight for voting rights, a lot of folks tend to keep it confined uh, to the act of voting, right? But I like to tell folks that when you're talking about voting rights, it's a much broader uh, a subject and it touches on so many other things. And, and definitely one of the things is really validating a person's existence within that particular society. And so many years back, you know, when I, you know, was a part of Florida Rights Restoration Coalition initially, uh, I really discovered the issue that Florida led the nation in as it relates to felon disenfranchisement which means that once an American citizen is convicted of any felony whatsoever, in Florida, they lost the right to vote for the rest of their lives, uh, along with other civil rights. And Florida at the time was one of four states that permanently disenfranchised American citizens. And we felt that this was a condition that needed to be changed. Uh, and so eventually, after trying uh, to change it legislatively and through lobbying the clemency board, which is the, the governor and his his board that consists of the attorney general, uh, CFO, and the commission of agriculture. After those attempts failed, the, the only thing that was left to do was to try to put this issue in the hands of people. And so we created a ballot committee called Floridians for a Fair Democracy to actually lead the effort to place the constitutional amendment on the ballot that will restore voting rights to individuals after they have served their time. And in 2018, we were very successful. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me change that. We were extremely successful in getting that initiative passed, not solely because we got it passed, 
but how we did, right? Where over 65% of Florida voters voted yes for it when all we needed to get was 60%. Uh, but in addition to that, we were able to get a wide diversity of support for this. And so there were over a million people who were uh, conservatives that voted for it. I think there's one study out there that showed that 40% of the people who voted for our current governor also voted yes on Amendment 4. And so that was a, a, a very like proud moment for me, uh, particularly not only because of the historical impact uh, that we had with really dismantling uh, uh, one of the remaining Jim Crow laws uh, that the state was still um, using, but what really stuck out was the fact that, I, and I tell folks this, that our campaign was a campaign that wasn't based on 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 preying upon people's fears uh, or you know or, or or hatred, but rather it was a campaign that was based on love, forgiveness, and redemption. And we got to show in 2018, we got to show the world that love can, in fact, win the day. That we can, as a country, as a community, as a state accomplish great things, right, through being guided by love rather than hate and fear. Uh, that's beautifully worded. And, and let's put it into context. Uh, I, I read your, your, your book and, and, and various articles, and uh, uh, you, you went off course at some point in life, and that's the, the, the real part of it. Uh, when I say real, you're a lot of us. A lot of people go off course. Um, and, and I think the fact that you went off course and where you are now is just a story of redemption, as you've just indicated. So tell, tell us, uh, about those early years that got you into some trouble and, and put you in the category, uh, in which you could be barred from voting and your other civil rights under Florida's, um, uh, uh, archaic law. Yes, most definitely. You know, I, I'm listening to you to talk, Ms. Pettis. And one of the things that, you know, I keep going back to is my my Christian upbringing, right? Which leads me to so many stories. And, and I'm thinking about the story about when uh, some folks brought an uh, individual to Jesus, right? Because this individual committed, say, committed a crime. Mm -hmm. And they were ready to kill this person. And, and Jesus, you know, rather than saying anything to them, he got down on on his knees and started writing in the sand. Some mm -hmm. people uh, believe that he's just started writing other things that people have done, right? And then you look up, well, any one of you all who have not ever made a mistake in your life, you be the one to cast the first stone to kill him, right? And uh, when he was done writing in the sand, I guess no one uh, could even make that claim. Uh, and, and so in my case, you know, I, I attribute every negative, almost every negative thing that's happened to me or that I've engaged in in my life to the fact that at some point I was struggling with, with drug addiction. Um, you know, uh, experimenting with, with drugs at an early age, recreational use of drugs, and, and eventually it turned into a, an addiction. And it was an addiction that caused me to do things to satisfy my drug addiction, my drug habit. Um, and that caused me to go in and out of jails. It caused me to actually get this uh, dishonorably discharged from the U.S. military. And and matter of fact, in, in, in that particular instance, you know, I joined the military to serve this country. And, and it was something that I felt very deeply about. And that was reinforced and even amplified while I was serving because I was in the aviation unit. And I remember working underneath a helicopter and seeing all these patches and asking what are these patches for and having the pilot tell me that those were patches to cover bullet holes, right? And hearing the stories about how pilots, knowing that they were going to get shot, still faced danger, right, to rescue uh, other American soldiers or to complete a mission. And even though they may have survived it, they went back again and again and again. And that really, really amplified my my desire to want to serve this country and fight for democracy, right? And I I, I did well enough to even become soldier, uh, I believe, of the quarter for a battalion, right? And, mm -hmm. and I was excelling, but I had a drug addiction. Mm -hmm. And that drug addiction caused me to get dishonorably discharged in spite of the fact that I had great potential. Mm -hmm. 
And 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 that's what I've seen in my life. You know, they're always, you know, I, I was a fairly smart guy and and I had a lot of potential. But as long as I was hooked to that drugs, I was never able to fully appreciate that. I say that story because in our conversation, especially when you talk about redemption, that's a key piece of it because, you know, we just can't throw away the key uh, for everybody that's done something wrong, that there is a redemptive value in each and every one of us, right? And I was just fortunate enough uh, uh, to be able to tap into that redemptive value Right. And become the person who I am today. You know, I was once a pariah on society and now I'm a contributing member. Right. But I had to get through that drug addiction that took me all kinds of dark places. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. As you were talking, Desmond, uh, I don't think you were a pariah on society. I think you had an addiction and 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 uh, it's interesting how society frames certain things. You know, when we have crack cocaine or cocaine uh, issues, and then you have opioids. Opioids in this society, they say, well, we need to give them help. That's a mental health problem. It's not a drug addiction. When you have crack cocaine or cocaine, you get put in another category. And even between the two, uh, cocaine versus crack, uh, crack is on the streets of most minority neighborhoods back in its heyday. Cocaine is over on the beach side uh, where people with affluence are using it. Uh, mm -hmm. How we as a society make all of these categories to put people in and don't allow for that redemptive opportunity. Uh, that, that always troubles me because we say we're society of, of, of faith and religion and, and, and all the values that God uh, had. But mm -hmm. when it comes to certain things, there's no forgiveness. Well, uh, I think if I could interject, I think yeah. part of that is because we are uh, a society that is susceptible to a narrative, mm -hmm. right? We are susceptible to basically what amounts to propaganda, mm -hmm. right? And as a result, you know, I, I always like to, sometimes I use the story about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where the United States went into a, a, a public uh, a, a, a propaganda campaign to paint the Japanese as certain types of people, right? And they they grossly exaggerated their features. And basically the narrative was Japanese people were going to come and destroy this country and burn our villages down and they're evil and they're wicked and they're dangerous, right? And they did it in such a way that accomplished two things. Number one is that they, uh, 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 they dehumanized the Japanese people. That's number one. And then they also desensitized us to their humanity. And they did such a good job that when they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and killed thousands of innocent women and children and men, rather than there be moral outrage, it was actually a celebration, right? It's that same type of narrative that uses the word felon and illegal as it relates to immigration or, you know, a, a, a super predator, you know, in, in those type of terms, right, that create a, 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 a environment that dehumanizes people like me. Mm -hmm. And so once I am a felon, right, then there's not as much empathy towards whatever made me a felon, right? Uh, and, and, and then there's not much motivation or commitment to changing the conditions that I'm experiencing as a person with a criminal history. And so uh, uh, whether I am uh, having difficulties getting a job or, or getting housing or being able to vote, right? There's not as much drive to restore those uh, uh, abilities to me, right? Because I am, and the narrative, because I committed the crime, I'm a bad person and I'm not as human as everyone else. When the reality is, is that I'm just as human as anyone else. We've all made mistakes. It's just that some of us haven't gotten caught, right? And some um, of them has gotten caught and 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 reinstated into society. Okay. You know, look, look, okay. look in Washington. There yeah. are people that have done more harm to society in Washington, DC and other places in this country. Um their greed and all the things they've done has had more harm on more people than you did with your personal drug addiction. Uh, but those people can get reinstated uh, and, 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 and to society, if you will, whereas 
if you're on the other end of the social economic spectrum, there is no opportunity yes. uh, for you to come in. So th that dynamic is just something we need to be aware of and accept because it's true. And anybody who denies it is not being truthful uh, to the reality of what goes on in our society. I mean, you see some of the things that have been done over recent political years. They go to jail and then they get pardoned and they're, they're back in the game as if nothing ever happened. You did your time, you come out, you're a positive factor in the community, but they won't, the clemency board won't grant you your civil rights back because of no forgiveness of what drugs led you to. And, 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 and that's, that's the battle we have here. Uh, the clemency board, tell us about that process. That's something that's really not known well in the state of Florida. And it's unique because of how aggressive certain governors are in keeping people labored yeah. with the tag of a felon with no civil rights. Tell well, us that process. Man, yes, it, it is, you know, and I could go as far back as um, uh, with Governor, um, Governor Jeb Bush, you know, the, Basically, in Florida, the governor and his cabinet have sole authority over granting clemency. And, you know, what we've seen was that, you know, during uh, Governor Jeb Bush years, I think the four years he served in office, about 75, 76,000 people were able to get their civil rights restored. And then Governor Chris came into office and he, he revised the policies. And because of his efforts, uh, over 155,000 people were able to have their rights restored. Then, but when H Governor Rick Scott came into office, he rolled back those policies and made it even more difficult for people to have their rights restored. And during his eight years in office, maybe around 5,000 people, if that much, was able to have their rights restored. And the process was uh, basically a process of anyone, once they completed their sentence, was able to apply to the governor to have their civil rights restored. When Governor Chris instituted his policy, what he did was he made it automatic for people who had were convicted of non-serious offenses mm -hmm. uh, to automatically have their rights restored. Uh, that impacted people, that had an immediate impact on people who were currently incarcerated because by the time they were, they were released, they already had their rights restored because it was a process in place. But for those who were already out of prison, they had to apply. And there were thousands upon thousands of people that had to apply, which created the backlog. However, people were able, like I said, 155,000 people in a four-year uh, period. With what Governor Scott did was he required, before a person could even apply to have their civil rights restored, they had to wait at least five or seven years after they had completed their sentence, right? And what we found, and, 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 and it's showing up even to this today, that people were waiting five and seven years after they complete their sentence. And when they applied, it was another eight year waiting period just to see if they had a chance of getting a hearing because getting a hearing was not a guarantee, all right? And so the clemency board, in, ess in essence, can pick and choose if they wanna have a hearing uh, for an individual that's applying. And so now you have people waiting upwards of 15, 20 years after they have completed their time to be able to have a hearing to see if they can get their rights restored. And at the time that we were looking at it real intently, what we found was that if you were lucky enough to get a hearing, you stood less than 0.001% of a chance of actually getting your rights restored, right? And you know, that was that was a huge problem because even the decision making process, there was no rhyme or reason to it. Right. And you 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 just mentioned that, you know, listen, I've done so many things uh since I've completed my sentence. Um, matter of fact, I could go down a list, name Floridian of the Year, Central Floridian of the Year, uh, made Time magazine one hundred most influential people in the world list. Uh MacArthur, MacArthur. Right. And I, when I applied to have a pardon, that was denied, right? But then there were so many other folks that would get their pardon. 
And so it was a purely arbitrary process in deciding who to grant clemency to and why, right? And and it was a real it was a real problem with me and and, and others because number one, when you allow four politicians to pick and choose who gets the vote, who gets clemency, that allows for partisan politics to play a role in the decision making process, and the. The other thing is because there's no rhyme and reason and 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 it's purely arbitrary, right? When it comes to voting, and, and especially when we view, view voting as the most important indicator of citizenship, mm -hmm. right? We ought to have something more straightforward, right? And so that was actually turned out to be the motivation uh, behind because I was, you know, like I said, I was led to actually start this uh, the ballot initiative. Uh, it was a vision that I said was given to me by God. And and part of the motivation was seeing what was going on and understanding that every American citizen, regardless of their political preferences, re regardless of the color of their skin, um, deserves an opportunity, should have their voices heard and play a role in determining how our community and our country is being governed. The um, I'm always uh, taken back by the fact that uh, we talk about the importance of voting. You want civic participation, but there's so many things done in our society that seems to try to suppress voting participation. So let's go to your amendment four. You want it. You want it by 65% uh, of the people that voted saying yes, uh, which I remember the day it was the only um, constitutional amendment that year that I was really interested to see how it went. And I was I was pleasingly uh, surprised that it went so favorably. I thought that was a testament to our greater society when politics is taken out of the way. Uh, people of all colors, persuasions, religions, politics come together for what is fair and right. After you won that, tell us what happened after that. Politics stuck its ugly hand in it, right? And defiled such... A, a, a beautiful thing. I mean, I was so um, disheartened and uh, and infuriated because, you know, I tell a story that, you know, we had politicians because felon disenfranchisement law that was had existed in Florida uh, existed for, like, I believe over 100 years, 150 yeah. years. And, you know, for years, politicians had opportunities to deal with this, Right. Uh, and I tell I tell a story of a politician just walking past a homeless family, you know, year after for 150 years and not lifting a finger to help this family that's sleeping outside in the rain, sleet and snow. Mm -hmm. uh, but at some point, the community got tired of it and said, you know, what? we're going to take matters in our own hands and we're going to build this family a home so they don't have to be out in the cold like that. And no sooner did the community build a home. Here comes the politicians rushing in, trying to dictate how the home is furnished, mm -hmm. right? Like, you had your chance to right this wrong, and you did nothing. You did not have the political courage to stand on what's right. The minute the citizens exercise their constitutional right to take matters into their own hands, now here you come after we pass it, and now this thing becomes political, and now you're wanting to determine or what the will of the people were. You know, if, if you'd known the will of the people so well, you would have been take, you would have taken care of this years ago. But you, you did think? not know the will of the people. And what happened, it is so easy to just make this um, partisan, right? And mm -hmm. it, it did become, all of a sudden, when po politicians got involved, it became more of a partisan issue. All right? And it's so easy to make it partisan but when I look back at the history of African-Americans and see what was done to African-Americans uh, as it relates to getting us access to the ballot box, what I realized, right, even looking at current uh, uh, um, practices that is ongoing across this country, I see a much, br a much broader issue. And that issue is since the formation of this country, there's always been a handful of politicians that wanted to pick and choose who got to vote for them. Right. And because at one point, you got to remember, not too long ago, uh, women couldn't vote. Right. Right. And they there were people that decided that, no, we don't want women being involved in this democratic process. 
And they went as far as brutalizing women physically. They went as far as imprisoning women, right, to, to really drive home their point, right? And they've done it in various forms of fashion, whether at first you had to be a white landowner, uh, you had to be this, you had to be that. And so they've always been uh, a tactics that's used, whether it's when redistricting, when you're seeing how these lines are being drawn, both with by Democrats and Republicans, right, to carve out your voters. And so all of that fall under the umbrella that politicians want to pick and choose who get to vote for them rather than allowing the people as a whole to make these decisions, right? And 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 so that, I believe, uh, uh, really uh, uh, played a big role in lessening the impact of Amendment 4, but it did not totally diminish it. Right, because one thing I tell people is that no matter what the legislature may try to do, you can rely on one thing that enshrined in our state constitution is an alternative pathway to be able to participate in democracy without having to grovel at the knees of those four politicians that sit on the clemency board. Amen. Right. The the uh the the reality of that victory on Amendment 4 is, what was it, 1.6 million felons when it first passed were now uh, reinstated their right to vote. And, and, and that's a lot of people. You know, when you look back at some of these elections that we've had, 30,000, 10,000, relatively small numbers in a state is this size. And the reality is they are afraid of what that 1.6 million people, how they would vote. And, and, and that's, that's just the, rea that's the truth, whether they <laughs> speak it or not. Yep. But yeah, that was, you no, know, I think that would make any politician a little nervous, right? Uh, <laughs> because we know that, especially, you know, in the work that we do, what, one of the things that we realize is that these politicians look at those numbers probably even more than we do, mm -hmm. right? And they have, and, and, and a good indicator, a good indicator of how well they look at these numbers, our legislature have the audacity to already pick out who's going to be the Speaker of the House three, four election cycles down the road, right? They're so confident in their, in, 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 in analyzing the numbers that they're able to do that, right? right? To us, to me, that's an insult of the process, Right. And, and, and so they know these numbers. And anytime you're talking about adding, I mean, you, you you shot some numbers out there. But one of the famous numbers you didn't shot was 500, I believe, in 27, because I think that was the difference of votes between Bush and Gore, right, to determine who gets into the White House. Exactly. Uh, what we do know it was less than 600. Yeah. And so in a state that historically uh, seen presidential elections decided by 100,000 votes, you know, I think at one point, I think in the first or second election, President Barack Obama won the state by 75,000 right. votes. And prior to 2020, you would have to go way back to find a time when anyone got into the White House without winning the state of Florida. Right. 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 And, and so it was a critical state. And we know that the reenfranchisement of and, and the number is 1.4 million uh, returning citizens. Uh, was uh, really represented a number that could have the potential of drastically shifting the landscape of Florida and the country, right? And so it was, it, but here's the thing, right? And here's a beautiful thing that, that, that I like to speak about too as well. Even knowing this, right? Even believing the potential impact of re-enfranchising 1.4 million folks, we had no opposition to the amendment. None. Not one penny entered into the state of Florida to oppose Amendment 4. And that is a phenomenon that people to this day cannot wrap their heads around. Right. Right. Because we ourselves expected tremendous opposition uh, to Amendment 4. And what we were surprised with getting was uh, really the type of embrace from all sectors of the state. And we were popular in the North. We were popular in the South. 
and in Central Florida. And that is rare when you can get uh, an issue that polls in the supermajority in every sector of the state. And when we looked at the numbers, right, we actually had the majority of votes, our Amendment 4, in every house district in the state of Florida. Wow. In every single house district. That's that's impressive. So when they came back after the passage of Amendment 4 and tried to put politics back in it, uh, under Senate Bill 7066, uh, they were disqualifying felons until they paid their their unpaid fines and judgments. That's what they stuck in there to slow down the influx of the 1.4 million. Yep. Well, one, one of the things, so uh, let me take a quick pause, uh, Mr. Pettis, uh, because one of the things that, that, that our organization do is also talk about the language. And we, we talked about the narrative and how, you know, it, it was amazing because prior to even the campaign, um, you know, folks was telling me that I needed the enemy, that I had to, figure out who the enemy was going to be, the bad guy. You know, typically campaigns, you got a good guy, you got the bad guy, mm -hmm. right? And I'm like, no, we don't need a bad guy, right? What we need is for people to see us as human beings. Compassion. Right? One of the things that we did was that we went from using the word felon to returning citizen, mm -hmm. right? We, we, we humanize it because when you, matter of fact, Florida State did a study that showed that when you call someone a felon, you actually increase the likelihood of them recidivating or committing another offense and how how we know that is true because we've grown up hearing time and time again that if you keep calling a child stupid they're going to grow up thinking that they're what yeah they're exactly stupid, mm -hmm. right and so when we talked about you know uh, uh um people with felony conviction we use the word returning citizen now when the 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 7066 came about what was at the crux of, of 7066 and the debate back and forth was determining what completion of sentence mean because our constitutional uh, amendment clearly stated that once a person has completed their sentence that they uh, are allowed the, uh, to the right to vote right and the the legislature wanted to take it upon themselves to define what completion of sentence was and they added all kinds of uh, financial obligations, legal financial obligations. Now, we knew that there were going to be a couple uh, of things that probably was going to be required, and that was statutorily imposed fines, and we looked at restitution. But the legislature added costs and fees, right, to this, and the dispute was basically, are those punitive legal financial obligations mm -hmm. or administrative uh, legal financial obligations. And we believe that once you complete the punitive portion, right, uh, when you, once you complete the incarceration, once you complete the probation, right, and the, the statutorily imposed legal financial obligation and not the cost of doing business in court, then that person should be able to vote. The legislature, of course, seen differently. Uh, even when it came to outstanding legal financial obligations, what we do know is that those at times are converted to civil liens, which means that the criminal aspect of it now is over. It's done. Right. right. And the legislature did not want to even accept that as well. And so that's where a lot of the, 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 the issue uh, allied, because when you looked at restitution or you looked at even statutorily imposed fines, they appear in a very small percentage of criminal cases in the state of Florida. But when you look at the cost and the fees, basically it's in every, in, in every case, you're going to see um, some type of legal financial obligation attachment to the case. And so that was, that was a huge uh, a, a dispute there. And, and what was sad about it was, was that, you know, these elected officials that was drafting 7066 was talking about the will of the people. And, you know, it's funny when elected officials talk about following the will of the people when you know for a fact they never even had a conversation with the people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And so you, can, I don't know how you determine that. But we were uh, my organization. We talked with individuals from the very beginning all the way to the passing of Amendment 4. And I could I can unequivocally say that 
the voters that voted for Amendment 4, right, did not have in mind that a person should satisfy fi the, 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 the court costs and, right. and, and the fees uh, before they were able to vote. What they were most concerned about was the fact that they finished terms of incarceration and probation. Correct. And, and and you said it a little earlier, but I just want to highlight it. And this was not allowing people who had committed heinous crimes uh, to vote. There, there were categories, as I recall, and you tell me uh, uh, if I'm yep. correct. There were certain categories, uh, uh, crimes on children. All of those people were not all being set free to go vote. And those, and, and, and we call them carve-outs, and those carve-outs was... Now, let me tell you, personally, organizationally, we believe that every American citizen should be able to vote. In Maine and Vermont, people get to vote even while incarcerated. They never lose the right to vote. In Puerto Rico, uh, which is a commonwealth, that they get to participate in uh, the presidential preference primaries, right, and in the elections while they're incarcerated. In almost every major country uh, 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 in the world, Right. In, in, in France, uh, you had someone that was elected as their their president and people who are incarcerated were able to vote. Right. 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 And, and so let me I just want to make that clear. However, right. I, I know what my beliefs are. Right. Right. Because my, my, I have I have four boys. And let me tell you, anybody with sons know that at some point or another, they're going to do some boneheaded things. Mm -hmm. Right. And they make you shake your head and shake their head. Right. Mm -hmm. But no matter what they do, they never stop being my sons. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that as an American citizen, no matter what American citizen do, they should never stop being an American citizen. And you actually strip a person of their citizenship when you strip them of the right to vote. Right. And so that's how we felt. However, when you talk about listening to the will of the people, Right. We extensively talked with uh, voters from all demographics across the state for many years, and they were very consistent. Right. That they believe folks should have a second chance, but they could not wrap their heads around giving second chances right now immediately to people who were convicted of murder, people who molested children or people who raped women. Right. Right. Those were the things that folks were they could not they they could not just wrap their heads around that and and so that's why there was a carve out there right we gave the people the voters what they said they could live with right right, right. and right. to have the legislature fur further reduce that i think is a, a slap in the face of our democracy you know one of the things is it's inconsistent with the claim that we're a free state if we're a free state, which is a term we're hearing more and more, and the people have spoken, why don't we allow those freedoms to ring? Uh, instead, they step back in and manipulate and regulate when they want to manipulate and regulate. And then when they don't want it, they call file that somebody's trying to mass mandate or you're trying to do this. You know, it, we're really, it's really hypocrisy at its highest, in my opinion. Uh, when you're claiming freedoms on one side of an issue and then on another issue, you forget about the freedom and the power of the voice. When however many uh, millions of people voted um, uh, on that amendment, on that amendment for. Tell me uh, what uh, fair democracy, what your organization for rights and restoration uh, coalition is doing. Uh, you're still fighting the fight on on. Um, uh, returning citizens, but what else are you confronting uh, with your organization today? Well, let me be even more specific, but before I do that, let me tell you, over 5.1 million people voted yes wow. on Amendment 4. Yeah, and you know a, what? a million more people voted for our initiative than for the Garrett governor in 2018. All right? L let me just make that very clear, right? That, that speaks uh, we had a million more supporters than yeah. he did. Okay? Remember 2018, between our governor and 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 Gillum, yep. it was a thirty thousand dollar a thirty thousand vote margin. Yes, it was. So yes, it was. That's why they're concerned about that. Whatever percentage of that one point four million uh, is because of the fact that it, it 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 letting those people have their rights as the state citizens voted 
mm. could impact some of these close races in, in, in so many different ways. Um, yeah. in, in, in so many different ways. But what we're what we're working on now is um, that you know I, I try to call it you know DPP, right? We want to really defend uh, people who have been arrested. You know, over the last uh, several months. Starting in Alachua County, you had individuals that were arrested for allegedly uh, registering to vote illegally or actually voting illegally. Uh, and it started with 10 people being arrested in Alachua County. Uh, and these were individuals that were registered while they were uh, incarcerated in the local county jail. Uh, and after that, uh, a couple of months after that, we've seen the emergence of the uh, governor's uh, election integrity task force uh, that started now arresting and targeted about, I believe, 20 people for arrest. Uh, these were people who uh, should not have, uh, the gov government claims should not have been registered to vote because they were registered or they were convicted of disqualifying offenses, whether it be murder or a felony sexual offense. Uh, and so what we're doing is uh, we have set up a legal defense fund as well as a bail fund uh, to help these individuals, number one, bail out because they should not be making decisions while they're incarcerated. And the fact of the matter is that these people were being incarcerated and because of their incarceration, uh, ran the risk of losing their jobs, yeah. right? And which further exasperates uh, issues that they may be facing Um you know, within their, within the community or, or in the family dynamic. And so we wanted to make sure that these individuals got out and then were able to, to fight their cases because there was a very strong belief on some very sound legal principles, right? That number one, these individuals should have never been charged, right? right? And if we have to go through the process, we were uh, fairly confident that it would be hard to really convict these individuals because of the, of the necessary elements that the state would have to prove. And we knew that they were not going to be able to prove it. Right. And then you had basically some fundamental stuff that everybody basically agree on. And it was very clear who do a citizen rely on to determine the eligibility to vote. And that's the state. And if the state tells you that you can vote and you go and vote, the state should not come back and try to take your Liberty for voting when they informed you that you could vote. And in the case of the first 10 people in Alachua County, there, in that case, you had a supervisor of election uh, officer that went into the local county jail and informed those people that they could register to vote. They should be able to rely on that. Right? All right. And just that in itself should be an ample or grounds enough to not want to criminally charge these individuals. If, in fact, the supervisor of election uh, was wrong and these people were not eligible to vote, then they should just be removed from the roster. Right. But when you talk about uh, uh, really pursuing criminal charges against an individual, um, you need much more than that. Right. You know, you, you look at what was going on. They had a big arrest here in Fort Lauderdale in Broward County uh, and over in Hillsborough County. Uh one of the distasteful things that I observed is, and I've represented law enforcement in my past over my 37 years. I don't now, but I've seen a lot of arrests, but rarely do you see the, the media following to put the arrests on, on, on TV. Uh, and right after the media gets the arrests on TV, there's a press conference of, 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 of all this governor's task force you know, cracking down on voter fraud when nobody's been able to document any significant voter fraud in yeah. the state. Um, and the few people that got arrested seem to have been more trying to send a symbol of putting a face on voter fraud by selecting who they were going to arrest as opposed to a real problem. It's one of those a solution where there really was no problem, uh, uh, no studies I've seen, and you correct me if you know of other information, has shown any material voter fraud that's influenced anything in the country, let alone the state of Florida. So why, why go and arrest these 50 people? Uh, even the closest election wasn't decided by 50 people in the state of Florida. Well, let, let, me, let me say this first, right? 
they they have been some uh, they have been some studies in Florida that have indicated something that's related, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and what the what the studies and, and general knowledge is very clear on is that our system has been broken, right? And you go back to Bush v. Gore, you go back to that election that was decided by five hundred and say 37 or 27 votes. And during that same election, there were approximately 2,000 people that were erroneously removed from the voting roll, 2,000 people that were denied the right to vote because someone erroneously thought that they were convicted of a felony offense and could not vote because of a previous felony conviction, right? And <laughs> so even as far back as Bush v. Gore, Right, it is common knowledge. It is well documented that our state system, election system, has some cracks and holes in it. Right, and it is those same cracks and holes, right, that allow these people to be even put in a position to where they were being arrested. Because at the end of the day, this is very clear. You know, a person fills out a voter registration form and sends it into the state. Say, hey, I want to be. I want to participate in democracy. It is the state's job. It's their responsibility to do the necessary research to make to ensure that that person is indeed a qualified voter. And if they're not a qualified voter, they are to reject it. But in these, every last one of these cases, right, the state went through their processes and determined that those people were eligible to vote, thereby issuing them a voter identification card. Yeah, the state was wrong because there was a crack. That to us was the biggest issue that has been well documented years before this. And our position has been before you can start threatening the liberty of any U.S. citizen, you should be, make sure that you take care of your side of the streets first. You should make sure that you're handling your responsibility as a government, right? You can't start arresting citizens because of your failures, mm -hmm. right? And that was clearly a, a case of a government failure in issuing these cards to people who clearly should not have been issued a voter identification card. Yeah. Right? And that's what sticks us most. The other thing that, that I say, because I remember prior to those arrests, we seen the raid in Mar-a-Lago by the FBI. Mm -hmm. And there were so many people that stood out and said, wait a minute, we're kind of concerned about this raid because we're getting ready to embark upon another presidential campaign, right? Uh, 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 another presidential election. And it seemed so political. It seemed like politics could be involved in this because uh, uh, Donald Trump has clearly indicated that he's going to be running for re-election, right? And the election was four years away, all right? <laughs> now, my belief was that the, if anyone was concerned about the timing of the raid on President Trump's residence in Mar-a-Lago, right, by the government, right, then they should be outraged at the timing of the arrest that was made in Florida just months before an election. Up and in week. some cases, days. Days. It was right. So, and, whether or not there was a legitimacy in in, in pursuing, you know, a uh, 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 some type of legal action, is one thing, but the timing was something, especially when we know that the state was given a list of names of people who could have possibly violated election laws over a year prior, right? Over a year prior. And so there's much more to that story that could be dissected and analyzed, but at the heart of what we're engaged in is the fact that, you know what? The system is broken. Let's focus on fixing this broken system. We don't want to get back. We want to get engaged in the partisan back and forth because every time that happens, the only people that suffer are the regular everyday people that's trying to really get on with their lives. And we wanted to place people as priority over politics. 
and fight for everyone. And and incidentally, within those individuals that was being arrested, uh, there was uh, quite a few of them that was registered as a Republican, right? And and so uh, we felt that you know if we can get the state to fix this system, and we're willing to work with the state to fix that system, right? We can create something in which no matter what a person's political beliefs are, right? If a returning citizen has served their time, right, and are otherwise eligible to vote, that they be encouraged to participate in our democracy because our democracy need their. We need the 1.4 million people be able to vote and be engaged in in how our communities are being governed. The um, and 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 that's why I think you've been recognized by so many uh, different respectable organizations. We ran by it pretty quickly, but I want to go back. Uh, the MacArthur Prize in 2021. That's not, you don't just pick that up. Uh, that's a highly, highly regarded uh, prize that you were uh, selected for because of the work you were doing in this space, not politically, but for all people. And in fact, in their, in their recognition of your work, it was the, the, the global, for lack of a better word, impact that it was having on having people to return uh, to their rights to vote, which is obviously speaks for itself. Time 100 in 2019 uh, recognized you as one of the most influential people in the world, not just little old Florida, but in the world. Um, uh, they don't give that out to everybody. Uh, that, that That's a pretty... Uh, select group uh, that those that board found, uh, and you mentioned Orlando Sentinel, um, the main paper in the city of Orlando, Central Floridian of the Year in 2018. It's hard to believe that those those entities uh, that represent the spectrum of who we are as Americans can see your worth, but yet our state still want to keep you without your civil rights. Uh, that's where uh, it's just telling. If we'd ever get politics out of the process and look at the good of humanity through a uh, equal prism, not a political prism, but one of equality, uh, then I think a lot of these issues that you've given up your years and decades fighting for, um, uh, you would continue to make progress. How can an everyday citizen help you? I, in this I do have a great update, though. I Who do. is that? Well, so let me give you the update first, right? Um, the update is, is that, you know, I applied for a pardon. It was turned down a couple of times. Uh, however, you know, with lo little to no fanfare, I did get my civil rights restored. Okay. Right? And so now I can uh, I can apply to the bar if if if, if I choose to do so. But I still have not gotten that pardon. And, 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 and that was the original request was uh, to get that pardon and, and seeing the type of people that were getting pardoned, um, even, on a, even on a national level, right? And, and just to be fair, yeah. you know, even on a national level, you know, we've seen uh, uh, in one case the ease of which people were getting pardoned, people who probably didn't even deserve to get pardoned. Uh, but then on a national level, you know, it's a struggle. It's a struggle, you know? Uh, I, I think that, you know, our current president should be should be bending over sideways to, to grant me a pardon, but that's not happening, right? Um, and so at the end of the day, you know, let the politics, the, 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 the politicians engage in politics, let the legislators engage in legislation, and let the litigators engage in litigation. And what I'm going to do is just keep my nose to the grindstone and just worry about everyday people. Uh, because at the end of the day, what I'm most concerned about and what drives me, what drives our work is to create a better world, a better community for everybody. Amen. Right? And I do believe that we can do it. And how people can help is, especially individuals who are attorneys, um, we, we have an amazing, robust uh, uh, pro bono uh, um, arm of our organization that engages attorneys to, you know, what the beautiful thing about 7066 was, was that they created a provision for the courts to waive those legal financial obligations. 
And so how are we uh, uh, protecting folks is by we're going into the courts, filing motions to get those fines and fees waived. And we're, you know, we have attorneys from across the state that have already volunteered to help represent individuals in these filings uh, uh, to get their fines and fees waived. Because once you now you have a court order that says that the individual uh, legal financial obligations are satisfied and they have the right to vote, right. then the state would be hard pressed to even come and try to arrest people like that. And right. so right, right. if our attorneys can, 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 can be a part of that, or they can be a part of our uh, uh, civil defense fund, a criminal defense fund in which we could defend people who have been uh, criminally charged, uh, who should not have been charged with, uh, with voting infractions. Where do uh, where can people get the information? Where to send the money and that type of thing? Oh, <laughs> easy. Uh, our website is basically www.floridarrc.com. Floridarrc.com, uh, and and folks can. Uh, we're also on social media. I'm on social media. Uh, Desmond Mead. I got the blue check mark next to my name, and so folks can also reach out to me. Uh, if they want to figure out uh, different ways that they can contribute. But our website gives people a wealth of, of, of opportunity uh, to be able to contribute financially, uh, to be able to contribute with their time. Um, we if, Even people who are not licensed. We have over, I believe, 150 attorneys across the country who have volunteered their time to research cases. Because one of the things, and the big travesty of all of this, is that the state is requiring people to pay their legal financial obligations before they're able to vote. But yet the state have a hard time in, in telling people how much they owe, right? And so you can't tell me how much I owe, right? But yet you want to hold me accountable to this. And so we have attorneys and uh, uh, folks in the legal field, whether they're paralegals or law students, that have volunteered their time to help research cases of people who have applied uh, for assistance. And of course, we've also raised over $30 million and we have paid out over $30 million across the state of Florida to uh, folks in, in, in various counties throughout the state where we've paid people fines and fees. We've actually paid it, right? Uh, to, uh, directly to the clerk of court. And these individuals um, now can register to vote. And then in addition to that, we know that there are over 600,000 returning citizens within the state of Florida who do not owe any legal financial obligations, who are eligible to register to vote right now, and they just don't know it. Uh, it's that um, uh, Juneteenth effect, right, where two year, even two years after. Uh, yeah, Matthew they hadn't gotten the news. Yeah, and they still haven't gotten the news four years, uh, uh, five years later, you know. Yeah. And so there's a lot of work there. Uh, we need a lot of help, uh, uh, particularly on, on the legal aspect, definitely attorneys, legal professionals. There's a lot of work uh, that you can do and get some pro bono credits and even some CLE credits uh, for some of the trainings that we have too as well. Um, I'm going to continue that conversation with you offline to find out how I can uh, be of some assistance in trying to connect you with resources. Um, you, you, you're an amazing gentleman. Uh, you're an amazing blessing to, to Florida uh, because I think you embody uh, what it is to get knocked down for whatever reason and to have the will and the strength to stand up. Uh, when I was reading over your materials, it took me back to the old quote, it's not where you started, it's where you finish. And uh, you should be proud of yourself. I know your family is, and those of us who know you are proud of you because you've exemplified that determined spirit that we need. Uh, and you're doing good. You know, you're, you're, there's a lot of ways the world could have turned and you select the highest road. Um, and you're doing good, not for Desmond Mead, but you're doing good for people, many of which you don't even know white, black, what, you know, you name it, male, female, uh, because you're in love with humanity uh, and you want justice for humanity. So I commend you, my brother, uh, and may God continue to bless you in this journey and you can be a blessing upon others. Well, let me, let me just thank you, Mr. Pettis, because even just seeing you um, 
uh, in, in Tallahassee, you know, uh, especially with your position at, with the Florida Bar at the time, mm-hmm. was very inspiring for, you know, a paralegal studies uh, of the future law student. Mm-hmm. And so you created a source of inspiration also uh, uh, to me, all right, uh, and, and watching you and how you handled your affairs, right, and how, you know, you conducted yourself and, and your trajectory uh, definitely gave me some hope as well. Um, knowing that you know what, uh, I could do this. Yeah. I could do this, and and, yeah. and so I want to just thank you for being an example, right? And who knows, maybe one day I might be a president of the Florida Bar. I don't hey, know. You yeah, know we'll don't don't give up on it. <laughs> do not give up yeah, on I know it. It's you know, possible. yeah, all things are possible, my friend. Um, uh, so I really appreciate your time. Uh, your remarkable story uh, and your work is not yet done uh, and continue to be used and listen to your inner spirit and you'll make Florida a better, more equitable place. Thank you. Thank you. The law firm of Hallitzer, Pettis & Schwamm is a proud sponsor of the Can We Talk 360 podcast. Our firm handles medical malpractice, wrongful death, catastrophic personal injury litigation, and workers' compensation matters. We pride ourselves in being advocates for justice on behalf of those who have been seriously injured. For decades, we've taken the lead in making your case our priority. It's who we are. It's who we'll always be. Hallitzer, Pettis, and Schwamm. Serious injuries, proven results. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Can We Talk 360? I sincerely hope that you are inspired to seize this moment in time and take real action towards change. Remember, all change begins with a conversation. Be sure to tune in every month for more fascinating discussions and motivational food for the soul. Please share with your friends, family, and colleagues. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Can We Talk 360 and visit us on the web at www.CanWeTalk360.com. 